is turn our cell phones to silent. You may notice committee members accessing their laptops, phones, or other devices during the meeting. They are using the devices to access the committee meeting materials that are in electronic format. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California, and as such, disruption of the committee's business will not be tolerated. We have a designated time on agenda for the public comment, and we will be asking for public comment on each agenda item. I ask that you be respectful of the need to conduct the committee's business. Should anyone disrupt the meeting, I will ask the person to conduct himself or herself in such a manner that permits the committee to transact its business. The committee welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is the committee's intent to ask for public comment prior to the committee taking action on any, any agenda item. If, so, if for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand or come forward and you'll be recognized. I would like to request all speakers complete a presenter slip so I can call you by name at the appropriate time and the record of this meeting can be full and complete. However, this is voluntary. Please give the speaker slip to Ms. Mary Kay Cruz Jones. Ms. Cruz Jones, she identify herself. This meeting will be available via teleconference. Individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make your comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, press star 1. You will hear a tone indicating you are in the queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not want to make a comment, press star 2. Please remember to mute the volume on your screen to avoid the feedback. Assistance is available throughout the teleconference meeting. To request a specialist, press star 0. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. However, during agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda, the committee has limited the public comment period for individuals on the teleconference and those present here today to 20 minutes. Therefore, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed for comments from individuals on the teleconference line and those in the audience. After 10 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Staff from the Board's Business Service Office will be assisting me with receiving the public comments via teleconference during this meeting. I want to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comment to three minutes or less. I would like to call this meeting to order and have Ms. Cruz Jones please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Here. Dr. Lewis? Present. Ms. Wright? Here. Dr. Yip? Here. Thank you, Quorum is present. And I would like to remind the members that we'll be taking a roll call vote on all action items. Moving to agenda item number two, public comments on items not on the agenda. Before I invite the speakers to come forward, I would like to ask individuals making comments to not discuss pending complaints, pending licensing applications, or pending disciplinary action that may come before the board for a decision. Such discussions are considered expected communications as they could provide information to the member that is outside of the record in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. Therefore, such discussion could create a conflict and lead to a board decision being challenged in Superior Court. The committee can receive comments regarding the committee's process in general, but it cannot receive comments on specific case circumstances where the decision is still pending. Board staff is available to speak with you about any pending matter. Please be aware that public comment during this agenda item should provide information to the committee members and is not a discussion between the members and the public. The only action members can take is to listen to comments and decide whether they want a future agenda item on the topic. No other action can be taken on the item at this meeting. 
Though this may seem at times like the committee members are not being responsive, following this guideline is critical to ensure the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed to avoid compromising the speaker's goal or the board's mission. So I have the following speaker slips. Uh, Mr. Tom Elichin, please come forward. Hello, good morning. Thank you for hearing my comments. My name is Tom Eichen. I am a representative with the California Statewide Law Enforcement Association. We represent multiple employees within the state of California, including some of the employees at the medical board. Uh, today, I would like to bring to your attention some issues with um, the enforcement program here at the medical board. Um, I'm sure you're probably aware of a recent bill, 17, I'm sorry, uh, Senate Bill 1448. It requires notification of doctors to notify the patients that they're on probation. And the medical board has a pretty active and um, uh, good enforcement program with the probation inspections. And the issue I'd like to bring to your attention is uh, some of the issues that we've been trying to resolve with Department of Consumer Affairs and the medical board over the classifications regarding the probation inspectors. Uh, they currently are titled as inspectors, and although the medical board also uh, retains special investigators that do some similar enforcement duties, uh, it's my understanding that all of the probation inspections are done by the inspectors. Um, I noticed in your minutes from, I think it was the last uh, quarterly meeting that the executive officer, Mrs. Uh, Kirchmeyer, reported on your staffing issues and I'm reading from item 6A of the agenda from the minutes of that meeting that talks about um, the vacancy rate, which is uh, um, approximately 19.5 vacant positions um, equating to an 8.5% vacancy rate. Um, but then it also spells out that seven of those positions are in the board's uh, probation unit. And um, we've been made aware that there's quite a caseload in that uh, unit in terms of the number of probations and cases that those inspectors have to do on a regular basis. We're concerned uh, quite a bit with, um, I don't want to call it a safety issue, but obviously um, an ability for them to do their job in a good and productive manner that might create some issues with, with some of this the new law that might require doctors to post this information, as well as provide um, the appropriate level of, of work that they're doing in that classification. We've been trying to work with Department of Consumer Affairs to reclassify that position, uh, which we believe would address the recruitment and retention issue. Um, but we believe that you know at this time, many of the inspectors bring to our attention the difficulty in their job to get the job done, which you know, kind of is a moot point in regards to somebody being on probation if you can't really monitor them and do the job that's required as part of their disciplinary action. Please conclude. I'm sorry? Please conclude. Your three minutes okay. are up. Okay. Well, we just want to bring it to the board's attention that maybe they can help bring this issue to a forefront with DCA. It's been ongoing since 2014 and we believe that it's just not getting dealt with and we'd like to see that the board maybe take an active role in trying to help pursue that and get that issue resolved. Um, we believe it's also an issue for consumers and not getting proper protection from uh, the safety of uh, these individuals that are now on discipline and being monitored. Are they being monitored accurately and being dealt with properly? Thank you. Um, are there any comments on the phone? Are there any comments on the phone? Sorry. Are there any comments on the phone? I apologize. There are no comments at this time. No comments. 
Okay, we have another uh, speaker slip just passed to me for item number two. Excuse me, sir. I want to make a comment on his talk. Dr. Rui, right? Yeah, yes. I just need to introduce you. Oh. That's your turn now. Uh, correct. But I want to make a comment on his, his talk. Is that allowed? You can yes. just, you know. Yes, thank you. Um, so, I, thank you. Uh, I'm Hannah Ree, Dr. Ree, and we are Black Patients Matter. Um, so, in that respect, I'm CD, um, I want to comment that we are very concerned that the um, DOI is not diversified, that, in fact, um, underrepresented under minorities are not um, being hired at an um, appropriate rate within the DOI and the DCA, as stated in our federal civil rights lawsuit that was filed against the DCA. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move on to our next agenda item three, approval minutes from the January 18, 2018 meeting. I move to. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Okay, you move in the second. I move in. <laughs> second? The okay. Are there any public comments from those in the audience? Yes. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, is this is this my three minutes? May I speak? This, this is particular to the agenda item of the minutes approval of the minutes. Oh, my apologies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any comments from those on the phone? We do have one comment from Kanwar Dagil, private citizen. Your line is open. Hello, I was trying to make a comment in the item, it's not an agenda, so it should reflect it as the public item, I mean, the agenda item too. And this is in regards to a closed complaint, um, and I am allowed to speak on a closed complaint, so I'll go ahead with the control number 800-2015-012300. Again, the number is 800-2015-012300. And this is in regards to an investigation done by the Health Quality Investigation Unit when they were not part of the medical board and they were designated to work under the Department of Consumer Affairs outside of uh, the medical board direct supervision. And the reason I'm calling today is because I drafted the complaint myself and it met all the elements that would have required the investigator to get the convincing evidence in this particular case the investigator that was assigned from San Jose office, Todd Ariyama, and I had a discussion and we were of a, a common agreement that um, the evidence that was gathered was enough to pursue the matter further. However, towards the end of the investigation, um, the supervising attorney, deputy attorney general on the case, uh, requested a change of investigator from uh, Todd Ariyama to Rebecca Sarnet, also from San Jose office. And I was just told uh, not too long ago, after three, three and a half years of this case file being open, that the investigation was closed without uh, further action as uh, they were not able to gather any convincing evidence in this matter. I would require um, members of the board who have access to the investigation file to get this file and look themselves and see if the health quality investigators would have been within the um, administrative control of the medical board would the outcome of investigation would have been any different i know certain members of the medical board have taken a position that uh, it was a well-intended effort of sanit to move the health quality investigators out of the um, the medical board into the dca in 2014 july but i think that was a grave mistake because it directly challenged and compromised the autonomy of the medical board to protect consumer uh, interests so it is my sincere request, board members, to pull out this file, 800-2015-012-300, and look for themselves and discuss to see if the outcome of the investigation would have been any different if those investigators were being supervised by um, the Chief of Enforcement uh, Medical Board of California. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments from the phone? Okay. No Ms. further comments at this time. Ms. Cruz Jones, please call the roll. Yeah, approve all the minutes. Dr. Bolat? Yes, approved. Dr. Lewis? Yes, aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. 
Dr. Yip. Yes, Minister approved. We we'll move on to uh, agenda item 4. Ms. Dell will provide an enforcement program update. Okay. Good afternoon, board members. My enforcement program update will include a review of statistics and timeframes and highlights regarding the various programs within enforcement. As referenced in the board's annual report, the number of complaints received continues to increase each fiscal year. During the fiscal year of 2017-2018, complaints increased by 1,200 from the prior year. And although complaints have increased, the number of field investigations and discipline taken has remained relatively sta steady. Um, and so at this time, because staff works very hard both in the enforcement program, in the health quality enforcement section, and in the health quality enforcement section of the Attorney General's office. I just want to say thank you to everybody for their hard work and their dedication, because they all do work extremely hard in furthering the board's mission of consumer protection. Regarding the central complaints unit's timeframes, there is a noticeable increase in the timeframe since June of 2018. Timeframes are currently at 140 days. That is a significant increase, but it's because of several vacancies that we have had. There were two manager positions that went unfilled for a significant period of time, and then there was several staff vacancies that needed to be filled due to promotions, retirements. Look at Dr. Lewis wanted to dim the light so that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Could I just, it's all bright right there. So. Okay. Retirements are individuals who are on extended leave of absences. So all of those have contributed to the increase in the central complaint unit's timeframes. We are in the process of filling the vacancies, the staff vacancies, and we are constantly uh, meeting together as managers to develop plans for cross-training, utilizing staff from other programs within the board and redirecting them to help with complaint processing. So it's a constant... Um, oversight that we're, we're always doing in the central complaint unit to create improvement. In the complaint investigation office, which is staff who are the non-sworn staff who handle investigations for the board, they are currently at 293 days to process their complaint investigations and that has remained steady. In the Health Quality Investigation Unit, again, they're at currently 512 days, and that time frame has remained steady. The average days to file former charges remain steady at 66 days. And the average days from when an accusation or petition to revoke or statement of issue is filed to a final decision is currently at 335 days. So every program has remained relatively stable except for central complaint unit due to the reasons I've stated have seen an increase. So in the central complaint unit, what we're currently doing is we're looking at all of the program letters that are sent out to constituents. We're making changes, we're making them more um, clear and concise, we're offering more explanations about um, standard of care and just making them more consistent throughout. In addition to that, we're evaluating all our procedures and that's with our strategic plan objective and we're also critiquing our case activity timeframes. We're, we're looking at each activity from when it leaves from the intake unit over to the quality of care unit, then over to the med consultant unit, and so forth. And we're looking at those time frames and looking at ways that we can um, diminish the time frames and make improvements. Within the central complaint unit, we have the case initiation unit, and we have made one significant change there. We changed the how complaints are processed, and we are able then to maintain compliance with Business and Professions Code Section 129B which is where you're able to notify the complainant of the initial administrative action taken within 10 days of receiving the complaint. Within the medical consultant program, a substantial, has changed, substantial change has been made to that program, and now that we use a software device called The Box, and that's where we're now sharing files with these medical consultants through an electronic format. And that's for security purposes. We are not sending information through the U.S. mail 
Um, we have to, if we do, we have to send it on encrypted disk, but we're now utilizing an electronic format and it's, it's, um, it's working extremely well. It's, it's been a lot more efficient. In the complaint investigation unit, again, we're evaluating all the procedures, again, part of our strategic plan as a whole. And one um, significant uh, training that we're working on is organizing urine collection training for our non-sworn staff. That training will be pr provided by our first source administrative, is our third party administrator of our biological fluid program. And it will be given via webcam, and it will include both classroom training and mock collection training. And upon the training, then staff will be able to conduct urine testing um, equivalent to Department of Transportation's urine specimen collectors. You know, topics of this training will include um, understanding of the DOT agency regulations, securing collection sites, conducting a proper collection, completing the custody and control forms, handling problem collections, fatal and collectible flaws, and collector's responsibilities. And, there, and this training will have to be provided every five years. So this is a significant improvement to um, complaint investigation unit because when they handle their cases, there may be some times when they're interviewing subjects that they may feel that there's possible impairment. And currently they'll have to go and utilize staff from the health quality investigation unit to help perform that um, urine collection because they're not, they have not had the proper training. So by them being able to be trained in this, then it's allowing for the sworn investigators to you know, divert their attention to what they need to do, which is their complaint investigations. In the probation unit, we're reclassifying a manager position to an inspector position, and that will be located in our Northern California probation office. And then we're also in the process of developing policies and procedures for the implementation of SB 1448, which is notification of probation to patients by subjects that are on probation. So we we're fully aware that that um, law is implemented come July 1, and we're already having meetings on discussing how we're going to be implementing it, and that inspectors will be able to monitor and enforce that. In addition, they're also gonna be included in the um, urine collection training that I previously spoke about, because again, probationers, or inspectors who meet with probationers, if they feel that they, um, there's a need to have them uh, tested on their urine when they're meeting with them, then they'll be properly trained to conduct a urine collection. The board's expert reviewer program currently has 897 act active experts. The board has put together a budget change proposal and it's in the process of being approved. It was included in the governor's budget. However, the funding has not been officially approved. What happens next is that um, it will go to the legislative budget hearings, which is usually around late February and May, March, excuse me. And then um, when the governor does a May revise to the budget, and then it goes and passes by the legislature after that, um, if, it all, if it all goes through smooth, then it will be signed into the budget and the expert reviewers will see a rate increase. The funding will be available come July 1 of 2019. So this expert reviewer program has not seen a rate increase. It's been the same since 2009. And currently it's at $150 per hour for reviewing a case and um, preparing your report, and it's at $200 an hour for testifying. So the rate increase will increase to $200 for report writing and review, and $250 for testifying. In addition to um, the rate increase, we anticipate much more uh, increase now in our training, our formal training that we offer to expert reviewers. We do two a year. So we're um, looking at possibly doing four in a year now to get more experts to attend the classroom training. I think component with the BCP is to get the rate increase, you would need to go to the formalized training. They are being trained when they get their expert reviewer guidelines, but we like to hit both components with the formal classroom training and the guidelines that are provided. And so we're, again, gonna be revising those guidelines. And um, as everyone is fully aware, as of January 1 of 2019, 
excuse me, 2019 vertical enforcement was repealed. So we have joint investigations. We held two meetings that were on November 16 of 2018 and January 10th of 2019 transition meetings to um, discuss with the Attorney General's Office and Health Quality Enforcement Section um, the transition of uh, the VE being repealed. These meetings um, were very productive. We put a lot of uh, processes in place, but I just wanted to stress that um, we just reverted back to what was the former model, so there isn't um, something that this is completely new. It's something that was done prior to VE, and it's a model that's followed by other boards at the Department of Consumer Affairs. It's, you know, it's investigations are done this way by osteopathic board, nursing, dental, physician assistant board. So it's similar in that respect. Um, Dr. Yip attended the November 16, 2018 transition meeting, so perhaps he'd like to have a few comments about that as well. We continue to have regular meetings ongoing, communicating with um, Deputy Chief Kathleen Nichols and Gloria Castro from the AG's office on the transition, and we'll continue to have those regular meetings as we move into this joint investigation model. And then there's also, with the joint investigation, specific case types where the Deputy Attorney General will be involved in the case from the onset and those are with sexual misconduct cases, cases that would benefit from having the Deputy Attorney General attend interviews with the victims and the subject licensees, and cases that warrant an interim suspension order, any case that poses a danger to the public, um, protection by having this physician continue practicing medicine. And then there's also interim actions where the Attorney General's office is involved in, and that's maintaining a PC-23 order, appearance in a criminal proceeding where you're going to get restrictions on a licensee's uh, to license to practice medicine. They're assisting with subpoena enforcement activities, and they're also working um, to submit petitions to compel a licensee either to a mental and or physical examination. That's pretty much it. Do you have any questions? I do. Dr. Lewis. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Thalp. Thank you. I was much clearer than I've seen in previous presentations, so I appreciate all those numbers I can just look at mm -hmm. instead of a presentation. I have a question about the expert reviewer program, and if this question is premature because it's going to come later with Dr. Nuevo's report, just let me know. Who actually uh, conducts the expert reviewer training? Okay. So it's a collaborative <clears throat> effort. The, the training is conducted by um, supervising deputy attorney generals from the Office of the Attorney General. It's conducted by supervisors and deputy chief from Health Quality Investigations Unit. There's a segment that includes our executive director, Kim Kirchmeyer, or deputy director, Christine Lolly. And we have a medical consultant who works for the Health Quality Investigations Unit, provides a case category, going over cases and how to review them. And then we even have a defense attorney that comes in and provides the perspective from the defense side to let experts know what they can expect when they're testifying. And then lastly, we have an administrative law judge who's retired that comes in and gives them the perspective from that point of view. So it's a full day, eight hour training, and it's, it's from the minute you start till the end, it's just compacted with a lot of information. As I listen to all this, uh, it seems like 99% is a legal perspective, but I'm trying to understand, is there a medical expert expert that actually comes in and talks about cases from medical? Because we find that we review the cases, we have experts that are minimal, they've just agreed to be They've just agreed to be an expert. You're not going to get a lot of primo experts with the rate we're paying. But I, I'm, I, I'm struggling with we're missing the medical expert to be part well, of the process. Right. There is a full segment, like I said, from our district medical consultant who, um, Dr. Klesig is the one who participates, and she goes through 12 case categories of specific cases and they talk about the case and there's an open discussion about identifying what would be departures and talking them through the medical aspect of it. And then they have an opportunity at the end um, to turn in a mock uh, report that actually gets evaluated and gives, is given feedback. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I strongly, strongly recommend every board member, if they have time, to attend the next expert review training. It's eight hour. I think Dr. Bodo was there. I was there a few times. It's very interactive. You can see a lot of um, um, compassion from our expert to come to the meeting. They ask good questions. We do have medical consultant. We have defense attorney there. So. Uh, I, I think it's really well run, and actually CME too. So uh, thanks, Mr. Um, I did attend a meeting back in November. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, Doctor, please, 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 Dr. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I wanted to uh, just go back on a few things. I'll start with these clarifying on the rate increase. I heard that. And there is a maximum. Is that true, 10 hours uh, for case review in general? And then you can ask for an extension. Correct. Okay. And thank you. And then any issues or thoughts on some new marketing strategies? Because people that actually go into medicine are very dedicated and passionate to their specialties. And I'm wondering what, and not to answer now, but to think about how, where, and how, and to whom we could reach out to get those medical experts that might be excited to share their knowledge to you know improve the care to our consumers in the state so that's just a comment but what's concerning still is and kind of dovetails to what dr lewis mentioned i know about the one physician that gets those categories and i think that's sensational but anywhere else within the um process are we able and are we looking at how these cases are categorized from a clinical perspective? Because there's two to three different types of hats that we're wearing. One on the legal side and going towards our administrative law judges. And then we have the clinical side so that when it comes to our panels, you know, we'll, we'll be often asking, you know, some clinical issues and how these get categorized. Is that something that we could get some insight to? Is that something that we could actually say, here's the categories and these are the dispositions? Just a small number, a small sample size. Is that possible? Obviously not the cases, but redacting the type of categories we go and what the outcomes are. Because at the end of the day, what are the outcomes? And I think you have a really nice picture here, but if I were to say, here comes 100 cases, where are they ending up? into what categories, and what's that time frame, and how is the triage happening? So those that come to the top, go to the top. And you probably have that whole process through your policies and procedures, but to be interested in that, that, that point and seeing that at a future meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, I did attend a meeting back in November to the, discuss about the transition from the VE to non-VE and um, in order to improve the efficiency and, and coordination of all parties involved. It was attended by the uh, um, Deputy Attorney General, Ms. Corey Castro, uh, Mr. Davis, and also by Mr. Chris and uh, Ms. Nichols from the HKIU. Um, all parties pledged to do their best to communicate early enough to each other, to share information, to advise on how to collect the evidence, due process, investigations, and medical expert review. So there are issues with the vacancy, but I think everyone seems to try to do the best to meet the guideline, the time frame, et cetera. Um, so hopefully next time when we hear the statistic, statistic the what's stable will become improved. Um, so, but again, thanks uh, uh, Ms. Depp and also our staff. Um, are there any questions, comments from the uh, public in the, in the audience? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Hannah Ree, uh, Dr. Ree. I'm a member of the CMA, Los Angeles County Medical Association, and recently elected delegate by my colleagues at CMA's Ethnic Med Medical Organization section to represent them at the, ne at the next um, House of Delegates um, meeting. I apologize, I'm, I'm not a public speaker. Um, so we are also Black Patients Matter. Um, we're, we're deeply, deeply concerned about the um, disparity and underrepresentation of um, uh, diversity within the uh, investigative unit. Um, as, um, as we know, there has um, been established or reported a, a bias, a racial bias against uh, physicians, um, 
against the underrepresented minority physicians. And recently, the Harvard Business Review, along with Stanford and Berkeley, reported that um, an interesting case, uh, black males were more likely to select preventative services when being cared for by physicians of the same race. And this could reduce cardiovascular related deaths in black males. And so therefore, when the um, Office of Investigations is, under, um, is not diversified, we believe that it uh, hurts black patients and it marginalizes black patients. And therefore, we call for increased diversity within the investigative unit. We don't see it in the leadership. We don't see it in the membership. And we don't see it in their, um, their STARS program where they recognize um, stellar employees. Um, so, and this is all stated in our federal civil rights lawsuit that's been filed and recently amended, and we seek change, um, and we always would like to work within the system um, to, to have that change. Thank you. Thank you. We have Mr. Connor Finney. Uh, hello, my name is Connor Finney. Uh, I am the patient's rights advocate at Consumer Watchdog. Uh, the reason I am here making uh, public comments during the enforcement committee meeting is to uh, draw some attention to some uh, troubling trends uh, in the medical board's enforcement program. Uh, Consumer Watchdog actually went through more than 10 years of medical board annual reports and uh, we found a, a, a fair amount of problems with the enforcement program. Only 14% of complaints were investigated in fiscal year 2017 to 2018. That is down from a median of 18% over the past 10 years. In spite of a 58% increase in complaints in the past 10 years, there's only been about 30% more investigations and only about 11 more license surrenders during this time. Uh, the time it has taken to conduct an investigation uh, has almost doubled, and uh, the investigation process is itself very opaque to patients. It is difficult to find out the status of investigations, and investigators will often close cases without even interviewing the patient in question. Um, the board has taken a great first step with the uh, interested parties meeting occurring after tomorrow's board meeting. I uh, would encourage the board to uh, not only take the concerns of patients and patient advocates seriously, but to come forward and offer concrete policy solutions to uh, fix the enforcement program, as well as to endorse actual concrete legislation that would uh, fix problems that the board uh, itself cannot change. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming. Are there any comments from those on the phone? Are there, there, are no, there are no comments at this time. Okay, thanks. We move to agenda item five, Mr. Christ from Health Quality Investigation Unit update. Good afternoon. My name is David Chris, and I'm the Chief of the Department of Consumer Affairs Division of Investigation, and this is Deputy Chief Kathleen Nichols. We will be providing an update on the Division's Health Quality Investigation Unit. HQIU currently has seven investigator vacancies, which is a 9% vacancy rate. Four of the seven have been given conditional job offers and are awaiting final clearance uh, to be hired. Of the three vacancies left, there are five candidates in background. We continue to run hiring panels throughout the state to select qualified candidates for the background process. Another new improvement that was implemented uh, January of 2019 was new language for the HQIU investigator positions. The positions are advertised as permanent full time if you already uh, possess a post certificate. If you do not already uh, possess a post certificate, the position is advertised as limited term and will automatically become permanent once post certificates are received. Uh, this will assist us to evaluate performance of investigators after they complete the academy uh, in the field offices and the full 12-month probationary period, as well as streamline the process 
for those who are unsuccessful at the academy. HQIU currently has five investigators attending a six-month uh, police academy. One will graduate in February, two will graduate in March, and the remaining two in June of 2019. Another investigator will be starting the academy in March and will graduate in August of 2019. We also have five non-sworn limited term investigators working to assist with the caseloads. HQIU investigators received, uh, received 12 hours of specialized training regarding conducting sexual misconduct investigations uh, in October 2018. The Specialized Training Unit also held a three-week mini-academy for newly hired investigators last fall and plans to hold another mini-academy this summer. HQIU continues to work with the assigned uh, Deputy Attorney Generals on interim suspension orders and will be working collaboratively with the Attorney General's Office on future ISO cases. HQIU has developed a best, pra best practices guideline for, different, for the different uh, investigation types which will be distributed to all, all investigators. Uh, HQIU investigators will continue working on reducing timelines and providing high quality investigations. This concludes our update and we'd be happy to answer uh, any questions you may have. Yes. Hi, Mr. Bruce. We've heard, of course, you know, we've heard these discussions at sure. every board meeting. What's helpful for me, I can't speak for my other colleagues, since we don't inf we can't influence your hiring and whatever there's union involved and everything else is involved right is that correct we can't hire and fire for you right correct the board has been supportive supportive yes i got that yes. supportive yes for me what's helpful is how many vacancies mm -hmm. um, now and in x period of time how many more are you going to have as employees mm -hmm. and this is what your projection is and that's really what I like hearing. Now, limited term, maybe people don't, a limited term is, um, they can be fired. There's no guarantee on that job. Correct. Right? I know, that, yeah. I've, it's, it's a holding category, and you may, they may lose their job. I don't know. Right. So if you could just tell us, today you have this, you have this many vacancies, with all the academy and graduations in 2001, I mean, 2021, you'll have these many vacancies left. Yeah. That's, that's helpful for me, because I'm a cut sure. and dry person. You know, I just. Sure, so, so currently we have seven investigator vacancies. Got that, it. That's, mm -hmm. So that's, that's what that number is. Um, with the, uh, the, the people that we have in the background process right now, when those backgrounds clear, uh, you know, which and then that, that's, it's, it's kind of hard to estimate how long that, that will be, but let's say, you know, uh, summer, uh, I anticipate them all being filled, but it's, uh, vacancies are a, uh, it's kind of like a snapshot in time, because you might have people retire, uh, you might, you know, have someone uh, who takes another job somewhere else. So um, we have more people in background than we have um, vacant positions. So we even have backups in case someone falls out of the background process. Yes, yes. absolutely. So, so I, I think over the past uh, 18 months, we've done a, a phenomenal job of, of, of getting out of our uh, uh, vacancy issue. I, I, I don't know if you recall at one time we had a 40% yes. vacancy yes. rate. So, so um, I, would consider that we have turned the corner on vacancies and we are um, you know at a similar vacancy rate to the other statewide law enforcement programs and it's yes helpful. yes yeah, it's, it's right okay it. yeah. yeah and so um, even even though it is a snapshot in time uh, our people are are working really really hard uh, to keep it uh, keep you know the vacancies to a minimum uh, you know, we're, we're conducting training, we're trying to be as, you know, forward thinking and as streamlined as possible. And, you know, some of these um, uh, details talking about the way we, we post uh, our positions and the continuous uh, posting, and, you know, some of these have really streamlined our process and helped us turn that corner. So, you know, I appreciate the, the board's patience over the past few years. And, uh, you know, I, I think one thing is an amazing compliment to our uh, investigative unit and, and the people who run it is that we were able to at least 
stay static during that time frame. Uh, yeah. and, and that we, you know, I fully anticipate that as people graduate from the academy and they complete the, the, the training period that the timelines will go down. Good, thank you, that's perfect, great, thanks. Dr. Bowler. Thank you very much. In that line, we've, and congratulations, 40% to 8% or 9% where you are right now, that's phenomenal. So yeah. you were having to count and doing a lot of things to say, how much are we getting in? How much are we, what's our output? Right. As you hire and you get these individuals from the academy graduating and then filling that position, those positions and determining what your goal is for what you would say is best uh, metric for vacancy, once that happens, as your visionary leadership through what you're doing, it would be great to start to see some of the impact and outcomes that you may have and how the processes that you've had to put in place that may have been very challenging because you were lacking staff would look very forward to seeing kind of the vision so that at the end of the day, all of these impacts and outcomes have one thing, and, and we all share this in the, here, is of course for our consumers of health care. So that looking towards the future, I hope, is a, is a really bright one. So thank you. Thank you. We're incredibly optimistic. Thank you for your support. Ms. Wright. You mentioned a best practices memo for the investigators. Can yes. you tell us a little bit more about that and what went into the process of generating it? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll let Kathleen handle that. We have several types of investigations that we work. So the best practices guideline was kind of to identify the main investigation types that we have. And then what are the best practices for investigating those cases? Kind of like a checklist for to make sure that you know, all the steps are covered, that the investigations are being thorough, that all avenues are being considered, and it's kind of in one place for the investigators to kind of supplement the formal training we give them, but it's an added resource. Um, for them, also for the supervisors, and also for medical board staff when they're reviewing our completed investigation so they can kind of see that, you know, that it, all the steps were done and that it was a thorough investigation. It was compiled with input from all of our investigative staff, line staff, supervisors, managers, um, given multiple, you know, feedback sessions to make sure all items were included. So it was a pretty comprehensive process. Um, and it's the first of its kind. It's the first time in the history of the investigative unit that we've had this. So we're very excited about it and hope it'll be helpful. Thank you. Well, Mr. Eric Andrews. Hi, Eric Andrews from the Patient Safety League. I have to uh, echo what Connor Finney from Consumer Watchdog said. I agree with all of those sentiments. This actually piggybacks on uh, Christina Delp's uh, agenda item as well. We often hear about how tight the budget is for the medical board. We hear about um, investigators and people uh, taking jobs and then getting a better paying offer and moving out of those jobs. It seems like the money is always very tight. This board takes in over 10,000 complaints in a year, but only disciplines about 4% of them. Think about what if even half of those 10,000 complaints were legitimate? Does the board even have enough money to process all those complaints? It's, an, it's, a, it's a question that I ponder all the time. It just doesn't seem like if we're barely scraping by to only put 4% of the complaints through, what if 5,000 of them were legitimate complaints. Where does the money come from then? And where, why are, where is the money to pay people who are doing these investigations properly so they stay in the jobs? It just seems like there's a money and budget problem thing that's really wrong here. Thank you. Are there any comments from those on the phone? Any comments on the phone? No comments at this time. Okay, Dr. Ree. Yes, hello. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chris. Um, really, truly do appreciate your department's hard work um, in the investigative process, as I myself am going through the process, have gone through the process. But again, here at Black Patients Matter, we are deeply concerned 
of the lack of diversity within your uh, within your department, as, sta as stated in our federal civil rights uh, lawsuit. Um, we feel that um, the hiring practices there are biased, and there uh, there is an underrepresentation of uh, minority workers there. And with that culture, it creates um, a result, which we then find with these um, complaints of uh, racial bias by um, minority physicians. And so we, we really want to reach out to the medical board in starting to um, recognize this and to um, understand that um, contracting with um, or working with individuals or entities that don't hire diversity um, is, is a problem because the results then are what we see, the complaints, the, the complaints from minority physicians that they're being targeted. And so that has been uh, supported statistically as well. And so, um, so for example, in uh, the, the medical experts that we utilize, um, when we look at their outstanding eight page, 10 page CVs, we don't see anything in there about being a member of uh, organizations such as the National Medical Association or um, any specialized training in racial, religious diversity, tolerance, that sort of thing. And so we would uh, really like to see the medical board start to acknowledge that and to change that and to um, support um, racial and uh, religious uh, diversity. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on agenda item six. Ms. Moore, Ms. Westfall, and Ms. Alvarez would now give a presentation on the medical board disability process. Discipline Coordination Unit. Good afternoon. I'm Alexandra Alvarez, Supervising Deputy Attorney General for the Health Quality Enforcement Section in San Diego. And also, I wanted to um, state that we do have five offices for our section in San Diego, LA, San Francisco, Sacramento, and now Fresno. Oh, thank you. There are 62 legal staffs, nine DAGs. Um, pardon me, nine SDAGs, 42 <coughs> deputies, nine paralegals, and this is Carolyn. I'm Carolyn Westfall. I'm a Deputy Attorney General down in the San Diego office. And we are here to present uh, um, the, um, the uh, Medical Board of California's disciplinary process in regards to accusations. Oh, you can't hear me? Sorry. I wish we had more than one microphone. So we're going to go through the display process. We're going to go through the role all the way through the post decision for you. Um, just to clarify, though, during most of the process, we represent the executive director, Kimberly Kirkmeyer. And then after the decision is um, adopted, we will represent the board. So you can go to the next slide. The Health Quality Enforcement's mission is to protect the public and provide quality legal services for our client agencies, including the medical board. We serve as the board's prosecutors and also as the civil litigators in civil cases. Um, the cases that we handle for the board um, can be the most complex, technical, and voluminous types of cases that DCA uh, healthcare oversight agencies handle. As you know, in January, the vertical enforcement program was eliminated, therefore effective January of this year. HQE will no longer be part of the investigation process, with the exception of a few cases. Now HQE will receive uh, cases from the board through a handoff model with no coordination with the AG's office. Um, a handoff model refers to completed investigations that are conducted by the investigators without any legal input with the Attorney General's office. To date, the medical board has committed to vertically enforcing um, some serious sexual 
misconduct cases and also cases that are identified by HQIU as cases that perhaps are interim suspension matters. In the Discipline Coordination Unit, there's currently a staff of 12. Uh, we have six analysts who are responsible primarily for processing all disciplinary actions against physicians uh, that is taken by this medical board. Uh, we review the documents for accuracy. Uh, we ensure that the documents are filed and provided to the <coughs> physicians or the uh, subject of the uh, disciplinary action and we ensure that the documents are posted on the board's website for public inspection. We also provide those documentation to persons of interest uh, via mail, uh, electronically, or any other um, method via fax if they'd like to have it. So some of the statutes that our section works with and the medical board are BP code 2229, which by law states that the highest priority for the board is public protection. Um, government code section 11371 establishes a quality, a medical quality hearing panel. The medical board is the only DCA agency that has this provision in the APA. This panel should consist of five ALJs, administrative law judges, and they are supposed to receive medical training. Um, government code 11500, that is basically, it has a procedural process including timelines for the service of accusations, of uh, statement of issues, and for producing discovery. Government code section Request for legal actions. Uh, basically, the uh, medical board refers um, uh, investigative cases where a violation of uh, the law has been substantiated uh, to the Attorney General's Office for prosecution. Uh, we refer it for the accusation, uh, which is a pleading that's filed that charges the, the charging document uh, for the violations, uh, statement of issues is for licensees who, uh, I'm sorry, for applicants for licensure who have had some uh, uh, issues uh, and are not eligible for an unrestricted license. Uh, the also the p petition to revoke probations, uh, those are individuals who are on probations and have had some uh, subsequent violation. Uh, requests for interim suspension orders, uh, those are individuals who uh, have had an, a, a violation of the law that requires an immediate and urgent action to suspend or restrict their practice. Subpoena enforcement, uh, requests for PC-23s, uh, petitions to compel mental, physical examinations, and for the appeal of a citation. Once a case is transmitted down to our office, it will initially be reviewed by an SDAG, um, although this task may be referred to a line DAG to review the investigation materials as a whole. So in this new handoff model, the initial review encompasses a, a brand new review of a case um, since the DAG has not been involved in the investigation previously. And so the SDAG or the DAG who's reviewing the case will review it in its entirety, every piece of uh, that investigation, every deposition transcript, the expert report, the medical records, et cetera. And they're reviewing this um, in light of assessing the statute of limitations, when this matter needs to be filed, as well as to determine the sufficiency of the evidence to meet um, the legally required burden of proof to file charges at all. And so when I'm referring to the burden of proof, a, a DAG is always looking at a case through the lens of their burden of proof from the beginning when we're first reviewing the investigation materials all the way through the end of the life of the case post-hearing. 
And for accusation matters, our burden is clear and convincing evidence to a reasonable certainty. Now, clear and convincing evidence, one may wonder really what that means. And I think the best way to understand that burden of proof is by comparison to other burdens within our legal system. And so if you look at it sort of on the scales of justice, how much proof, how far do we have to tip those scales in order to meet our burden? And in civil court, their burden is the preponderance of the evidence, which essentially means it's more likely than not that the charges are true. And if you look at those scales of justice, the person bringing those charges just has to tip them ever so slightly. Uh, one little pebble on one side of that scale will tip that scale, and that means they have met their burden. On the opposite end of the spectrum is in a criminal court. Their burden is beyond a reasonable doubt, and that's evidence that leaves you with an abiding conviction that the charges are true. That's the highest burden in our legal system. And the scales of justice where, with the preponderance evidence, it just slightly tips, beyond a reasonable doubt, it tips significantly, almost to the bottom. Our cases are somewhere in the middle in our administrative cases. That clear and convincing evidence is evidence that is substantially more likely than not that the charges are true. So it's more than a pebble, and it doesn't quite tip it all the way to the bottom. It's somewhere in between there. That's our burden of proof in our administrative cases for accusation matters. So when the Attorney General's Office receives a transmittal, what we'll do is we'll initially review the evidence and we'll let the, the board know what's going to happen. There's three possibilities. One is that there will be a full or partial acceptance of the transmittal. Two is that there is a closure and return of the initial transmittal. And there'll be various reasons. One, perhaps there's a second interview that's need, needed or perhaps the review of the expert was the wrong expert, so they needed to select the correct one, or perhaps there's a clarification of the expert report that's needed, or in another instance, additional witnesses are needed. And the third possible possibility is a rejection of that transmittal, perhaps because the lapse of a statute of limitations. I'll go ahead and do this one. So when we do receive the accusation and it's an acceptance, and our cases with the medical board contain majority of the time multiple patients with a high volume of evidence. It can entail review of thousands of pages of medical records, listening to a subject interview with complex issues and discussions with experts regarding their opinions. These are very high, highly complex cases compared to the other boards. Um, for cases that were initially VE'd under the VE pro project we had before, the former assigned DAG will be assigned to plead the case and litigate the matter, but we expect these cases to phase out within a year or less. For true handoff model cases that we accept, a HQE DAG anywhere in the state can be assigned to review lead or litigate the matter, and that's de depending on the workload. The types of dis disciplinary charges, um, I won't go through their entire list, but we have them here and then they're included in your packet. Uh, we do have quality of care cases where it's, that's gross negligence, uh, repeated negligent acts, incompetence, <coughs> sexual misconduct, overprescribing. Um, and the and the list um, as you see it over there. And there is also violations of law, such as prescribing to addicts or aiding and abetting the unlawful practice of medicine. The discipline coordination unit reviews the files, uh, reviews the accusation uh, before filing. Uh, for accuracy, uh, we also. Uh, present the document, the finalized document, to the executive director for review. Uh, we review the document for accuracy. We present it to the ex uh, executive director for signature. Uh, we are responsible for serving that document on the physician, uh, ensuring that the physician, um, uh, and we receive the proof that the physician uh, has been served and again, the information is placed on the board's website and it's available for public inspection. 
We also monitor certain cases to ensure, uh, again, the proof is received and we may in some cases have to serve the document a second time. So after the accusation is filed, the board or the deputy attorney general uh, may receive a notice of defense which is filed by the physician. Uh, the physician um, within uh, 15 days of, file, uh, of an accusation being filed against them, the physician must assert its rights to the hearing, uh, to have a hearing, and that's done through the notice of defense. If the, if the physician fails to file a notice of defense, then the Deputy Attorney General or, or HQU will draft a default decision and submit that to the medical board for review and signature. Upon receipt of the default decision, it's presented to the executive director for signature. After an accusation has been filed, we, uh, we sometimes receive supplemental investigation on a physician, um, which may be some loose ends from the initial investigation, uh, or it could be an entirely different investigation against that same physician that has uh, reached a conclusion. For efficiency purposes, the client will request consolidation into the pending case for filing of an amended accusation. The law permits uh, us to file an amended accusation at any time during the course of the case, but an administrative law judge certainly has discretion to set a deadline prior to the originally set hearing date, um, or in the alternative may continue the hearing date to allow, um, to a later date, to allow the respondent sufficient time to prepare a defense to the newly added charges um, or allegations. Discovery in administrative cases is pretty very straightforward. Unlike in the civil arena where you can use interrogatories, questionnaires, and depositions, we have more of a straightforward production of documents. In rare cases where a witness is unable to attend or cannot be compelled to attend, we can motion the OAH for a deposition and the parties will use that deposition transcript as, the, as part of evidence in their, their hearing. Most of our cases involve expert witnesses, and we're required to designate our experts in our cases prior to hearing. This is a function, of a requirement that's unique to the medical board. None of the other licensing agencies have this requirement. We're required to designate our experts at least 30 days prior to the originally scheduled hearing date. We're also required to exchange reports that are prepared by the experts. A recent amendment to the Business and Professions Code Section 2334 allows some discretion for the administrative law judge to extend the time for this exchange um, to when a hearing date gets continued. Uh, DAGs and HQE are expected to exchange their expert report and designation shortly after receiving the notice of defense. However, um, most defense attorneys do not provide us with their expert designation reports until 30 days before the hearing. Because of this late uh, disclosure, we oftentimes cannot have any meaningful negotiations with the other side until 30 days before the hearing date. Um, so we, it's very difficult to resolve a case any sooner than that, despite when the accusation was originally filed. This is particularly difficult with medical board cases because these are the battle of the experts for most, more often than not. Uh, we can get outgunned at the very last minute, 30 days before hearing, when the defense designates oftentimes multiple experts. We have a case pending right now where we have one expert and they just designated five, 30 days before hearing. That, that's a lot of work for us to not only try to settle a case, but it's a, work, a lot of work for our experts to then absorb all of those reports they just also received, five other opinions attacking their opinion, and for us to then prepare cross-examination for all of those experts all in that last 30 days before the hearing. When a deputy prepares to do a settlement recommendation to the executive director, there are a lot of components that are uh, in that we make for these cases. We review the disciplinary guidelines. The DAG determines whether there are issues with their expert. 
perhaps a change of opinion after they received the respondent's expert reports, perhaps there was new evidence attained or provided by the respondent. They also take in consideration any defenses that the respondent provided. We also look at mitigation and aggravation. Mitigation would be early acceptance of responsibility. An aggravating factor could perhaps be prior discipline. We also look to see if it's a alcohol or, or substance abuse case. We look at the uh, prescription guidelines. We look at the uniform standards for alcohol and abusing licensees. Once we formulate a settlement recommendation, we provide it to the executive director. And we're also always available for her if she has any questions or issues. And all these settlement offers are approved by the executive director. And there is a wide range of possible uh, discipline. There could be a pre-accusation public letter recommend, reprimand, which are for minor violations, such as failing to maintain records. There's public reprimands, where are usually for minor violations where probation's not warranted. There's actual probation, and of course, there's revocation. The deputies use the disciplinary guidelines to formulate the recommendations and follow them unless there, as we just discussed before, there's some type of mitigation or evidentiary problems that warrant a departure from the guidelines. Once the settlement is received, it is submit, uh, prepared and signed by the parties it's submitted to the, the Medical Board of California it's received by the Discipline Coordination Unit. Uh, the Executive Director will review the document and she will, um, uh, and at that time it is presented to the panels of the board for review and consideration for final adoption. If the settlement, uh, the stipulated settlement is adopted, then the Discipline Co Coordination Unit staff will serve the decision, final decision, on the uh, physician and update the public disclosure. If the uh, settlement is not adopted or uh, held for discussion, it will be presented to um, the panel for review in closed session at a panel or board meeting. When settlement is unable to be achieved, we take these matters to hearing. Because uh, the physician's license is considered property, they are permitted a hearing to give them their due process of law before uh, their property can be taken. Uh, DAGs prepare for these hearings by organizing the evidence, preparing any necessary motions in limine, and meeting with witnesses, particularly with those expert witnesses in the vast majority of our cases, to go over their opinion in more detail so we have a really adequate understanding of the medicine involved so that we can not only direct their examination but also uh, handle cross-examination of the defense experts. And al although the rules of evidence are not strictly adhered to in our hearings, for all practical purposes, our hearings run very much like a bench trial in superior court with the orderly presentation of evidence uh, by way of opening statements, direct and cross-examination of witnesses, production of evidence, and closing arguments. We always present our case first and have the opportunity for rebuttal since we have that burden of proof of clear and convincing evidence. Upon, uh, after the hearing is conducted, the administrative law judge provides a proposed crafts and provides to the board a proposed decision. That proposed decision is then submitted to the panel of the board uh, for review and consideration. The panel will determine whether or not to adopt the decision, and if it's adopted, then again, the discipline coordination unit staff will serve that final decision on the physician uh, if and update the public disclosure. If the uh, decision is held for discussion, it will be presented to it will be presented to the panel for discussion during closed session. Do, do you have the panel? Which one? I'm sorry, <laughs> didn't click it. So sorry. Oops. So the uh, panel, the, there are two panels for the medical board that review 
each case uh, that's presented um, as a proposed final uh, decision, uh, whether it's a stipulated settlement or a proposed decision after an administrative hearing. The stipulation uh, that is held, the board could decide to adopt the stipulation. Um, they could counter the stipulation, uh, the order of the stipulation, or decide to reject the stipulation, and that means that the stipulation will go through the process of an administrative hearing, will proceed to hearing. Uh, for a proposed decision that is held, the board could decide to, I'm sorry, the panel of the board could decide to adopt the proposed decision, adopt the proposed decision, and reduce the penalty if warranted. Uh, adopt the proposed decision and make technical changes or remand the proposed decision back to the administrative law judge for the taking of additional evidence uh, or decide to non-adopt the decision and review the administrative record to, to uh, create a decision um, that is um, that is um, in line with the laws and the violations that have occurred that the physician has, um, has um, the violations the physician, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, I got stuck on it. You know, the violations of law the physicians uh, was, was charged with. I do apologize. Uh, once the board has reached its final decision, the respondent, the licensee, can appeal that decision in a few ways. First, they can file a petition for reconsideration, which is a legal filing where they highlight some points they believe the board overlooked or did not consider fully. And uh, the, a DAG in our office responds to those um, with legal filings. Second, they can also file a writ of mandate in superior court in, in either San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, or Sacramento only. These writs may only be filed pursuant to uh, Civil Code, Code of Civil Procedure 1094.5. This is also a legal filing which we consider is in a closed universe. They cannot present additional new evidence absent ex extenuating circumstances, and they cannot call witnesses. The court is only to consider the administrative record and then, of course, the legal arguments submitted by counsel. The nature of the, these appeals usually involve arguments that the findings are not supported by the evidence and that discipline ordered by the board was somehow an abuse of discretion. The respondent's burden in these cases is very high, so the board's decisions are rarely disturbed by the superior court. Um, in addition to the petition and the writ, they can also file an extraordinary writ in the appellate court or there can be a grant of cert by the California Supreme Court, which are also very rare. I think that's all we have, unless there's any questions. So I also did want to point out that we provided a administrative matter accusation flowchart that should be in the packets, and that can d basically describes how our cases flow from the beginning to the end. Any questions from the members here, Dr. Lewis? No? Dr. Paula, please. Yes, thank you very much. I thought it was an excellent presentation. It just really helps, I think, frame things so that by the time things get to our panels, these, these cases have been through the legal system and to do with clear and convincing evidence that is what's presented in our board or our panels are making decisions to adopt or non-adopt and all of the ramifications. But I'm interested in Government Code 11371 and that's with the five full-time ALJs and the, in, in that process because prior to everything upstream is the only time there is a clinical oversight, in other words, someone that is a physician is looking at this is kind of at the end at the panel and then just at the beginning of triage, meaning when it comes to the uh, central complaint unit, or is there any other experts or people in between? Obviously the expert that you've hired to do the expert review, that's the one person that's doing the work with the information. But I guess my question is, is there anything in the court system, Carrie, at all that is there anyone or anything? It's it's separate, right? These are separate entities. Right. Does that make sense? There There is a, a medical consultant that reviews quality of care cases in the central complaint mm -hmm. unit. 
And then in the uh, health quality investigation unit, there are medical consultants that are work with those offices. I see. But nothing, so the, when the five ALJs, that, that group is looking at it, that is there with their medical training and looking at it with the eyes through the law, that's how the decisions are being crafted as to the proposed decisions that end up coming to the panel. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes, they're given that training. And also they have a provision, the APA, that if the ALJ wants to get an outside expert, they can do that. Thank you. I think in the past we did have some in-service training for the ALJ as well as like medical terminology and anatomy and all that too. So thank you. We I have one more comment. Just a real quick comment, which I didn't really understand until you said that, that a medical license is property, like a house is property, and except in a few cases, we don't have the right to just take it away from them without due process. And that's really important to know. Just a few cases, we can just yank the license, but it's property. Is that right? Yes, it's very few. And even in interim suspension orders, if we do get in an ex parte order taking the license immediately, they set a hearing very close, like within 30 days, to make sure that that license was taken away appropriately. Thank you. Very important point. Thank you. We do have two. Um, Public member would like to make comment, Mr. Eric Andrews. Hi, Eric Andrews from the Patient Safety League. Back in January of 2017, Judge Feinstein, who was on the board at the time, talked about a case where a DAG had screwed up getting evidence and they had to throw the, compl the, dis the complaint out completely. And that was never followed up on. We never heard anything more about that, even though Ms. Castro said she was going to follow up on it. I'm wondering how often that kind of thing happens, where, where there's mistakes on these cases and they just get tossed out completely. Um, no one seems to want to talk about those things that happen with the board. Uh, these ladies would actually be good uh, to post the question to that I was referring to earlier. Um, what would happen if they had to work on even half of the 10,000 complaints that come in every year? Would they have the manpower and the money to, to work on all those complaints? And finally, um, do you, any of you ever wonder why the doctor can appeal a decision, but the victim or their family cannot. It just seems so unjust that, because things happen with these decisions, things go wrong, and we're bringing in people every meeting now that are talking about their decisions going wrong, and they don't have the right to appeal these decisions, but the doctors do. It just doesn't seem equitable. So I think you need to think about that. Great, thank you, Mr. Andrews. We have Mr. Hollingsworth. Hello, my name is Marion Hollingsworth, and I'm a patient safety advocate. Uh, one thing I had a question about with the presentation is it didn't seem to be clear to me um, why doctors are allowed to plead down to uh, different um, to lower reprimands, for example, why are doctors allowed to plead down to public letters of reprimand in death cases? We've seen a number of egregious cases where the doctor has a number of extreme causes for discipline uh, in, the, in the accusation, yet he's allowed to plead down to a very minor violation such as poor medical record keeping or not monitoring nurses. Now public letters of reprimand we've noticed in the past um, annual report were up 55% last year over the previous year and it brings up the concern over whether that there is a new pattern of leniency going on. According to state law, uh, PLRs or public letters of reprimand are reserved only for very minor cases, yet we are seeing a lot of them where the patient died. Um, e and even where in cases where the experts say that the doctor is um, incompetent or lacks medical knowledge, why are these reprimands being allowed, uh, why are these, excuse me, why are these plea bargaining um, 
deals being allowed to where the doctor can basically get out of a death case. And how does this policy protect the public? Thank you. Yeah. We have two more. Uh, Mr. Mario Guzman. My name is Mario Guzman. Six years ago, I was the victim of gross medical negligence resulting in injuries that you see today. I was an athlete and engineer. Today, I, I am not only a multiple amputee, but also paralyzed from the neck down, rendering me dependent on my spouse and my caregivers for all my daily activities. Despite your own investigation finding that the care I, that I received was below the standard of care and referred to the Attorney General's office, the physician that harmed me receive absolutely no disciplinary action and currently practices without a spotless record. I was the victim, just this medical board did not give me enough respect to say why. I guess I should not be surprised, even though the medical board, California Medical Board is a public consumer protection agency, it has in fact worked hard to protect the interests of the lobby groups that are supposed to regulate and protect us from. From the CURES database, to our efforts to have doctors on probation disclose their status to their patients, the California Medical Board pretty much stows the line of entities such as the California Medical Association and other interest groups, pretty much curtailing any efforts for transparency and accountability. It is no wonder why of the 10,900 complaints that you received this past year, 87% were, were closed, with the victims not having so much the courtesy as to know why. Maybe they are dead and in your eyes not even worth the effort. This medical board spends $33 million a year in its enforcement program, an enforcement that yields a paltry 300 disciplinary actions a year. That is, those ranging from probation to suspension and those letters of disciplinary action are not even worth the paper they are written on. We don't know what happens to those 9,400 complaints that are closed. And this is why bad doctors can practice for years, resulting in cases such as Dr. George Tyndall, who abused hundreds of patients over the years under the complicity of, this, of his uh, co-workers and employers. I go to bed with a clear conscience because I know I did my best to remove a bad doctor from practicing. Your office, on the other hand, will be responsible for the many patients that he's that this doctor will kill or harm if her online reviews are any clue. Given your behavior throughout the years, it would be better for this board to be shut down as was proposed several years ago, instead of, spend, of spending millions in this sham of justice and accountability because I am a consumer, I am a victim, and yet these injuries are not even worth your while. Thanks for your comment. We have, um, excuse my, the, the, so, Wamina Parada. Ludmila Parada. Thank you. And um, the wife of Mr. Guzman. 15 hours, based on the California Medical uh, uh, Board's report, that is the amount of time that the approximately 70 plus investigators of the California Medical Board would allocate to each one of the 10,888 complaints that they were filed last year. 15 hours to review the complaint, the medical record, and the merits of the case not even two full days of work, and that is how much an investigator will work, at best, to see if the doctor that harmed you or killed one of your loved ones is worth his salt or not. Having seen the tens of thousands of pages that a complex medical record can have, I must say that this is simply impossible. And that is why I'm sure that those 9,421 9, complaints that were closed and sealed, according to the medical board because they have no merit, were in fact closed because nobody even bothered to open the file. I know that in my husband's case, it took me three times to file a complaint. I filed it on the mail, I found it online, and I actually had to go to the office and deliver it in person because they lost it twice. Much other but nothing is made about the enforcement work that this board does, a work that yields a part three, 300 severe disciplinary actions per year, which is an astounding 2.7% conviction rate. 
In the meanwhile, the vast majority of those unfortunate victims that suffer at the hands of a negligent physician or a sexually molesting one will receive a letter, if they're lucky, saying that their case was closed due to lack of merit. Any effort to audit and see whether this is in fact the case will yield no result, as these files are sealed and therefore protected from any freedom of information requests or third party audits. So pretty much we, the California taxpayers, are spending $33 million a year in an enforcement agency that simply opens and shuts the suffering of its victims with no repercussion whatsoever. An enforcement agency that works its damnness to protect the interests of the physicians that they're supposed to monitor, supervise, and reprimand. An enforcement agency who under their watch have seen cases in which doctors have hurt and harmed patients for decades, despite receiving reports of wrongdoings for years, as is the case of Dr. Anthony Bianchi, multiple sexual molester that is currently on probation, or Dr. Ramon Fakuri, which is also on probation for similar complaints. This is the enforcement agency that currently protects us from wrongdoing, and that is why I'm not surprised to see that medical harm is currently the third leading cause of death in the United States. I ask this board, what are you doing in terms of tracking those close complaints to ensure that there is no apparent of concern, especially in cases related to sexual assault or prescription abuse? I bet you do nothing, because even in cases that has merits as my husband, you simply turn a blind eye at the detriment of victims and the state coffers alike. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, Dr. Ree. Uh, yes, thank you. So. Um, uh, those of us physicians that um, are not hospital affiliated, um, caring for Medicare patients are caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, we're really trying hard to follow these Medicare guidelines so as not to be penalized. Um, but on the other hand, defending ourselves against accusations from board mem medical experts who have never practiced or d have never even heard of these Medicare guidelines um, and are unfamiliar with MIPS. Several of my EMOS colleagues have complained extensively that the medical experts used by the board are retired. Many of them don't, have never even practiced in the state of California. And in fact, um, several of them maintain a non-diverse patient population by choice. And so we are deeply concerned about the, um, the choice of medical experts being utilized by the board um, as being not trained or exposed to um, uh, diversity and uh, religious diversity as well, and also um, use, utilizing medical experts that are not familiar with Medicare standards and MIPS. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments from those on the phone? Are there any comments on the phone? Are there any comments on the phone, operator? Yes, we have two comments. Our Please. first comment comes from Susan Lauren with Lipo Co Coalition. Your line is open. Hi. Actually, I called to speak at the beginning of the regular meeting, but I'd like to just tell you that we're having trouble with the phone lines. Um, the last speaker, um, the, the doctor who just spoke, spoke loudly enough. Everyone else is, um, we can't hear them on the phone. I've talked to other people listening. And also, the, it's muffled. It's, a, it's not a really good connection so uh, it's hard to know what's going on but I am going to speak at the beginning of the other part thank you thank you this another one con comment comes from Anwar Gill with no affiliation your line is open well my name is Kamar Gill and I would uh, want to briefly um, touch on the administrative uh, um, judicial process or the disciplinary process just talked about um, you know, there is a big talk about a uh, physician's license being property, and I, I believe it's a constitutional provision uh, guaranteed under the 14th Amendment, no doubt. But what I've noticed is that when physicians are forced or uh, tricked into doing stipulated settlements, um, partly because the money to defend these actions is limited as part of the malpractice insurances, and most of the insurances would pay up to in a standard policy, pay up to about $25,000 to defend medical board action, and that money is pretty much used up before even um, preparing a case for uh, an administrative hearing. So what I was trying to come to was, the, though the standard for taking or revoking physician's license is convincing evidence, what a lot of physicians don't know, 
that the standard for revoking a probation is preponderance, more likely than not, 51 percent. Um, so those cases, I think, uh, you know, um, physicians uh, are not aware, and I believe as the physicians would become more aware, more cases would go through the administrative law judge um, handling those matters versus stipulated settlements. And I think that would be coming uh, as the MA takes a position to de um, um, properly advise physicians. Um, the second issue that um, I, I would want to raise uh, is that um, the process of investigation, including the choice of investigators that is assigned to a particular case, depends on three or four things. The fourth one is gone, but I would, I would say the three things that define the course of investigation are, number one, the color of skin of the physician, number two, the country of origin of the physician, Number three, if the physician is a male or a female, and there was a number four, which is no longer in picture. It was David Sarano Savell. Good riddance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item seven, future agenda items. Any members have agenda items for the next enforcement committee meetings? No. And any public comments from those in the audience on future agenda items? Dr. Ree? Yes, thank you, uh, Medical Board. So I would really, um, I, I think that this is a great opportunity, a great time with the new governor and some wonderful changes going on in the state of California to start addressing um, racial diversity as far as um, updating um, or making current um, actions within the Medical Board so that we are addressing um, the importance of racial and um, ethnic and religious diversity in, in our licensing processes and also with um, accusations that are filed against physicians so that in fact, um, if in fact a, a provider or a physician does not have a mental illness but is acting odd or that sort of thing, we must take into consideration their ethnicity and their religious beliefs. And in order to be able to do that, we had to not only better train our investigators and, and whatever else is involved, involved in that pipeline, but also I have, you know, we at Black Patients Matter have very serious concerns about an investigative um, organization that does not hire underrepresented minorities. Blacks, Sikhs, um, Muslims, we just are not seeing that. And so then when in fact there are all these reports coming out and studies that have been uh, coming out as well of um, actions taken by the board against certain um, you know, minorities, uh, African American doctors, we then understand how this process occurs. And then most importantly, why do we even care about that? Well because of the recent study that I had mentioned previously from coming out of, uh, you know, down the street, Oakland, Stanford, uh, Berkeley, stating that, for example, African-American patients, male patients, do better um, choose to participate in preventative care when their doctor is black. And so with all that information, I think it's time, this is a great time for us to um, to allow someone such as our organization, Black Patients Matter or another organization, to come and make a presentation about the importance of hiring and contracting and working with um, organizations, medical experts, um, the investigative process um, that hire black people, period. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments from those on the phone for future agenda items? Are there any comments on the phone? I'm showing no public comments. We'll now move to agenda item eight, adjournment. Dr. Lewis, second. Thank you all. Stay for the whole board meeting. <laughs>